Ham on Nye is my whimsical title for the debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye. In the picture they're reversed, Ken Ham is on the right. It took place in the Creation Museum in Kentucky, that's just south of Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, it was uh, done on the 4th of February in 2014 to a fairly packed house. And the question on the table was, is creation a viable model of origins in today's modern scientific era? And we'll see how they approached it. Later on, I'll give my own comments. The debate itself was moderated by Tom Foreman of CNN, and those of you who don't instantly recognize that, this is a picture of him from the debate itself. <coughs> uh, Bill Nye was a, uh, introduced as Bill Nye the Science Guy, which fits since he had a television program of that name for a long time. Um, he's also had other television programs. He's uh, listed as a scientist, engineer, comedian, author, and inventor. And um, he got his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Cornell University. Ken Ham is president and co-founder of Answers in Genesis and is the guiding force behind the Creation Museum where the debate was held which is a very nice museum, by the way. Uh, he got a bachelor's in applied science with an emphasis on environmental biology from Queensland Institute of Technology and went on to teach high school, having gotten also a diploma of education from the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Um, and uh, that's, of course, in Australia although I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, <laughs> depending on where you're from. Um, <clears throat> the debate was carried online, and um, um, this is an outline of how, we're going to, how they were going to do the debate. Uh, basically, Ken Ham won a coin flip at the program and went first. So they didn't know who was going to go first until they walked into the building. Uh, there was a five-minute introduction by Ken Ham, a five-minute introduction by Bill Nye, who came second, of course, and then half-hour presentations. Again, Ham first and then Nye second. And then five-minute rebuttals, uh, again, Ham and then Nye. Five-minute re-rebuttals, and then finally, there were audience questions, and there were about 16 of them, so there's quite a few of them. And the format of the question was it would be asked if the first one went to Ken Ham, and Bill and I had a minute to respond after Ken Ham had his two minutes to answer the question. And then the next one went to um, Bill and I for two minutes, and then Ken Ham had a chance to respond for another minute. And that was the format, and people kept to it with one exception where uh, Bill Nye ran over his time, and we'll note that. Um, but otherwise, they were all within the time frame that was listed. Ken Ham started his five-minute introduction with a video of Stuart Burgess, who's a scientist in England, and an inventor, and a creationist trying to make the point that scientists can be, or creationists can be scientists or vice versa, however you want to put that. Uh, he hammered on the difference between observational science and historical science, very strongly making that distinction. Um, he noted that Venter is an atheist scientist, but Raymond Davidian, who is the inventor of the uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, was a creationist scientist. Uh, again, another example of a creationist who is uh, generally recognized as a scientist. 
And he said that molecules to man evolution has nothing to do with developing technology with the implication that, hey, you can be a creationist and a scientist, there's no problem, especially technology. And finished with the statement that creation is the only viable method of historical science confirmed by observational science in today's modern scientific era. Now, that statement is a little stronger than what the question was, which was, is creation a viable model? He says it's not only a viable model, it's the only one. That was his five minutes. Nye's five minute introduction wandered a little bit more. He talked about wearing a bow tie. There were two other people in the audience who wore a bow tie. And his, he learned it from his father, he learned it from his grandfather, who learned it from an undertaker. At least that's the story. And he said, we're gonna compare two stories. One, Mr. Ham's story, and one uh, that from the outside. And that was a contrast that he constantly painted. Mr. Ham and his group, and then the outside world. He said, CSI, crime scene investigation, makes no distinction between observational science and historical science. He talked about the flood with a wooden boat with eight zookeepers for 14,000 animals. It's impractical. Um, every land plant under the water for a year, it should have killed them all. Different fossils for different layers, none of them swam upwards to a new layer. Now how you would determine that is rather interesting and that's a subject we might take up some other time. He said if you could find evidence of that, you could change the world. So he's being very, very empirical and open, at least sounding that way. Uh, he talked about billions of religious people who don't believe in a flood. So why do you have to believe in a flood? and by implication a six-day creation. Nye's concern, uh, which he expressed I think sincerely, is what keeps us ahead is our technology, and our technology is tied to science, which is tied to evolution, which means that you, know, you have to take the whole ball of wax. If we continue to eschew science, and he didn't go of all those inner uh, uh, connections, he just simply used science in a kind of a broad sweep, we're not going to move forward. And he wanted us to move forward. We will not embrace nature's laws and we will not make discoveries. Um, of course, Davidian's discovery of MRI kind of puts the lie to that, but he talked about observational versus historical science. Uh, I'm sorry, now we're done with him. That's the five minute introduction. And now we're into Ham's presentation. And Ham, again, talked about observational versus historical science, went over that quite thoroughly. He talked about Craig Venter and also Danny Faulkner and Stuart Burgess, who are creationist scientists, and had them talk on videotape, which I thought was somewhat effective. And even uh, Davidian talked on videotape. Uh, he, ha he talked about non-Christians borrowing from the Christian worldview, that is, the laws of nature are constant, the laws of logic are constant, they were put there by God. He quoted a geology text that recognized the difference between what they called physical geology, that's experimental science, and historical geology. Uh, making the point that observational versus historical science is not just a creation science idea. He showed a picture of the boundary between the Coconina sandstone and the Hermit Shale and he says, we agree on the units, geological units that they're there. We agree on what minerals are in there. Those, that's observational science. What we disagree is on the dates. And he mentioned briefly a 10 million year gap and I think it was a missed opportunity because he could have gone into uh, periconformities as uh, Ariel Roth is fond of doing. Uh, and, and made some experimental science points that I think would have uh, strengthened his case. He just mentioned radio, radioactive elements without dealing with them, which I thought was a little unfortunate. And then he 
came to a place where he said, can you name one piece of technology that could only have been developed starting with a belief in molecules to man evolution? Which I thought was a good point. He said both sides use the same evidence. It's a worldview that makes the difference. Observational science, and this was a very interesting comment uh, given many people's perception of, of their view. And perhaps this should be amplified sometime. Observational science can be used to confirm, or otherwise, one's historical science based on one starting point. So he sounds reason-based in this particular area. Now, he said also historical science does make predictions that one can test. And this is an important point, too. And he said an intelligence produced life. Animals reproduce after their kind. There was a global flood. There is one race of humans. The Tower of Babel in different languages, although I'm not sure how you test that. Um, and young universe. And those are, the, those are the points that he said could be tested. Uh, he discussed after his kind, which he equated to more or less the family level. Probably the genus level in primates, probably the superfamily in birds, but those are, he didn't go into that kind of detail. But he says, you know, the dog family, the cat family. Um, and he talked about a s the paper that said a single origin for dogs and a single origin for finches. He said the world, uh, word evolution has been hijacked, as he put it. He called it a bait and switch which was observable changes are used to infer unobservable changes. Um, he quoted a paper that confirmed that all humans are in fact related. And then he quoted Bill Nye, in fact I think this was video, show, uh, saying you, um, you can show the earth is not flat, and this one was not video, I, I take it back. There's another one that was. You can show the Earth is not 10,000 years old. And he agreed with the first, but disagreed with the second. He then outlined what he would call creationist history, which comes uh, with the seven C's, creation, corruption at the fall, catastrophe at the flood, confusion at the Tower of Babel, Christ, cross, and the consummation, the new Earth to come which hasn't gotten there yet. In Matthew 9, 4 through 5, he noted that Christ quoted Genesis 1 and 2. I think trying to head off people who want old age but, uh, uh, but still want to be Christians. He said that Genesis is foundational to theology and gave some arguments for that. And he said that when people claim creationism is religion, he said there is a religion of naturalism, of secular humanism as well. And he said those people's view of religious liberty is that they get religious liberty, not we get religious liberty, which I think was a fair point. And then he repeated his refrain from his five minute introduction, creation is the only viable model. Nye's presentation started out with, we're here in Kentucky. He said, standing on millions of layers of ancient life. And he had a fossil with him that he picked up along the road. Kind of putting everything, you know, you can do this too. And he asked, how could all these millions of fossils have lived their lives in 4,000 years? Of course, if you put most of the a flood in one year, what you're actually saying is that how could those all be alive at the same time? And I, I think it's a fair point, and he could have sharpened it if he had been a little sharper on his opponent's belief. He talked about ice cores, which contain samples of atmosphere and 600,000 layers. Now my understanding is that actually in Greenland you lose it at about 2,000 years and the rest of that's done with electronics, uh, conductivity, and uh, 
and uh, to a certain extent uh, oxygen-18 is uh, isotopes. And that in, in Antarctica, there actually aren't annual layers. So what you do is totally, uh, uh, you know, how, how you want to believe on that. Uh, he's off an uh, order of magnitude. It should be 60,000 layers. Well, it's 60,000 in Greenland. But it is 600,000 in, in Antarctica, but they're not distinct layers. That's the point. And he doesn't know that, which is okay. Uh, Bill Nye doesn't know everything. Paul, just one little point. There are some places in Antarctica, of recent deposits, where you do have annual layers, but those that they study for the long ages, they don't have layers. That's correct. In fact, it's kind of interesting because the annual layers outside um, as as uh, Ken Ham will point out, the annual layers outside are not really annual layers. They're probably storm layers. Um, he, uh, he mentioned bristlecone pine, 6,800 years old. How do you get a uh, creation 6,000 years ago? He mentioned old Chico in Sweden, which is supposed to be 9,550 years old. That's a new one on me, actually, so I won't comment too much on it. Um, the Grand Canyon, he asked, how do rocks settle out in the middle of a flood? Which I thought was an interesting argument. Um, he talked about ancient riverbeds, which really aren't there so much in the Grand Canyon as they are in, for example, the Morrison Formation, um, which I thought he's... He's being fed, um, what should I say, popular geology, which may not always be totally reliable. And then he asked the question, why not more Grand Canyons? Um, well, there are a few, actually. But anyway, he talked about no mixing of mammals with trilobites, which is one of the points that I think would be important. Um, I'll tell you what I'd really like to see is a dolphin down there with the uh, with the trilobite sometime. Uh, perhaps a half chewed up dolphin. He talked about uh, turbulence during the flood. Wouldn't there be a lot? Wouldn't it mix all of the fossils? Um, I think not realizing that when deposits are laid out, generally speaking, the turbidites, which means they hug the bottom. He doesn't appear to have realized that turbidites exist. And then he had a whole slide of fossil hominin skulls and he said, you know, what do you do with this, basically? Uh, he talked about the fact that no kangaroos are found on their migration from the Ark in Asia to Australia. And how did they get there? There's no land bridge there. Um, uh, the land bridge may be a problem. Uh, but I, I would say that the uh, that there are also almost no bison, and there used to be millions of bison in the plains, the Great Plains area. They're gone. No fossils. That's because fossils require rapid burial. And so if there wasn't rapid burial of kangaroos, they're not going to be found in Asia. He kept talking about Ken Ham's flood and Ken Ham's kinds, uh, personalizing it uh, quite a bit. Uh, and then he made a kind of interesting point where 7,000 kinds went to 16 million species. He says, that means that you've got 11 new species every day. I think that some of those 16 million species are beetles. And in which case, of course, they didn't come from the flood. And there might have been quite a few other uh, types of species. And we may be getting, you know, three or four new species every day. Um, he talked about Washington. This was an interesting, I think, a misunderstanding. Washington State, where there are boulders sitting on top of the uh, Palouse Formation, with um, uh, uh, the the with the Lus, the Lus deposits there, and um, he said, if the flood came over, wouldn't it bury those boulders? I think not realizing that most creationists believe that the 
Washington State uh, that the Brett's floods were post big flood. Um, he said the rocks should sink to the bottom. He talked about the Wyoming, which is not the state of Wyoming, but a wooden ship, which was made by uh, people like his forebears, skilled shipbuilders that foundered because it kept warping and allowing water to come in and was lost with all 11 hands on board. And it was smaller than the ark. And it's, can you build an ark and make it work? He talked about 14,000 animals, you know, male and female for 7,000, in a space smaller than a zoo. Of course, this was not uh, prime habitat. This is simply survival. Um, he talked about Tikalek, which was found where it was predicted, which is true until we found fossil footprints. Um, and he said, what's sex good for? And he says, there is a resistance to your enemies and specifically resistance to parasites. And he gave a study where that had been found. He said that prediction has been borne out. The idea is evolution makes predictions. Can creationism make predictions? He talked about the stars moving apart, the Big Bang, cosmic background radiation, spent some time trying to establish that that was in fact what happened. And with the implication, of course, that how does light from stars millions of light years away get to us if they were only created 6,000 years ago? He talked about rubidium strontium related to nuclear medicine. Rubidium strontium, of course, rubidium being uh, one of the elements that's used for And it's used in nuclear medicine and said there's no place in Kentucky to get nu a nuclear medicine degree. And you see, if you don't believe in evolution, if you don't believe in radiometric dating, then you lose out in modern medicine. That happens to be not true, but I don't think he knew it at the time. He talked about parallelx, again, hammering on the star issue. How far away are the stars? We know how far they are away. He talked about ice cores, trees, rocks, starlight, the wooden arc, kind of summarizing everything, and then Asked the question is Ken Ham's creation model viable? Again, notice the, the dig at Ken Ham. He's all by himself except for the people that are under his pay. And he said no. And he said that it's important because students need to learn natural law. Otherwise, they won't be equipped for the modern world. Now, I thought that um, Certainly most Adventists, and I think most Christian, conservative Christians believe in natural law. Ham then rebutted for five minutes. The age of the earth is historical science, the genealogies. Uh, he talked about radiometric dating and uh, uh, carbon-14 dating of wood that was encased in basalt. And the difference was 45,000 versus 45 million years. Makes you wonder what that exactly means. He talked about the potassium argon dating of Mount St. Helens, where the whole rock dated 0 0.35 million years. Uh, two different fractions dated 0 0.9 million years and, uh, and 2.8 million year fractions, almost 3 million years. This stuff was seen to emerge from Mount St. Helens after 1980. There's a problem here. This should date to zero, right? Um, he talked about the geologic time scale, which is inconsistent with Christianity. Again, trying to take out the, the middle ground. And he said there's hundreds of dating methods. And he had a list that was uh, partially covered up by uh, graphics, so you didn't see the whole list. Um, and 90% of them require a short age. He said, if you found 45, uh, uh, pardon me, nice rebuttal now. If you found 45 million year old rock on top of 45,000 year old wood, maybe the rock slid on top of the wood. That was his answer. Um, the Bible, uh, later on there was a rebuttal and I didn't put it in that uh, said, no, the, the rock is encasing the wood. It didn't just slide over it. Um, 
And um, he, ca he talked about the Bible is written in English, which is kind of interesting. American English later on. Yes, he kept coming back to that. Uh, he, he asked, are the fish sinners? This is getting into the, you know, can God be fair? Is God being fair to the fish and didn't do anything wrong and yet are being punished for it? Uh, and then he talked about this idea that you can separate the natural law of the present from the natural law of the past is at the heart of our disagreement. Well, it actually isn't. The heart of the disagreement is miracles. And we'll come back to that. Well, no, what it says is that there are exceptions in natural law. Right. It's the natural law are the same. Uh, Adam and Eve were still subject to gravity, etc. Um, he said, your assertion that all the animals were vegetarians before they got on the ark? Oh, not before they got on the ark, in the Garden of Eden. But anyway... He said, are we supposed to take your word for English words translated over the past 30 centuries instead of what we can observe in the universe around us? This is a recurring theme. And basically, it comes down to who am I supposed to believe, you or my lying eyes? Um, Ham's re-rebuttal started out, natural laws haven't changed. They're the same, the same laws. But unfortunately, not making the point about miracles being the core. Uh, he objected to the language of Ken Ham's model. He says it's the creationist model for all kinds of people, many of whom aren't employed by me. He says species versus kinds. He came back to that. He talked about tree rings, ice cores, and kangaroos kind of just listing them very rapidly and went back to the ice cores, talking about the planes that landed in, in Greenland during World War II and had hundreds of layers of, of ice above them in the space of 25 years. Well, that kind of makes you wonder about those yearly layers. Um, he talked about lions and teeth. Uh, lions uh, aren't carnivores. I mean, our lions are carnivores, but the teeth don't necessarily prove that because he said, look at bears. Look at pandas. Pandas have nasty sharp teeth. And they eat bamboo. Fruit bats have nasty sharp teeth, really needle-like. They eat fruit. So you can't tell an animal's diet from its teeth necessarily. And you certainly can't tell its original diet from its teeth. Maybe lions ate fruit in, the, in, in Eden. Um, he talked about the Missoula flood and said it was a post-flood, post-big flood catastrophe. So the boulders could be left there by the Missoula flood and not covered up by the Great Flood. Uh, he came back at a point that, um, that Bill and I had made about uh, Noah being unskilled and the uh, shipwrights couldn't build a boat well enough. He says, you can't assume that Noah was, was unskilled. And he said in defense of his theory that yes, Yes, we have a light problem, but so do you. You have to have um, inflation, which is a kind of a, a non-natural uh, law kind of solution to the problem that you have. So, uh, it, yeah, well, nobody knows exactly what to do with light, so the fact that we do, it doesn't really matter that much. And then Nye came back with his re-rebuttal, which is Ham's revised numbers make the species problem worse. Now instead of 7,000 species, you've got 4,000. Now you've got to create that much more. Well, of course, the difference between 4,000 and 16 um, million isn't that much greater than 7,000 and 16 million. So I'm not sure that uh, that, that point was a... Uh, a very powerful one. He couldn't believe that Noah had superpowers and so therefore the boat problem was still a problem with him. And he said the fundamental problem is what you can prove. Um, he says our assumptions are from experiments. And he said why should we take your word for it? Which is basically, you know, you've read this book, you think you know the answer 
we see differently, why should we believe you? And he talks about, again, about billions of people who are deeply religious but don't accept a young earth. So why are you, why are you imposing this on religion? He said, the creationist model is based on the Old Testament, and I'm not a theologian, but uh, what about the New Testament? Which I thought was kind of an interesting argument. And then, and then he asked, what is to become of us? Meaning the people who don't believe in creation or at least a 6,000-year, uh, 6, 10,000-year of creation. You know, are we lost because of that? He talked about out-of-place fossils. He says, you know, find some. Bring it on. It'll be impressive. This is the Cambrian rabbit argument, uh, not s stated quite so baldly. And he said, microwave radiation is not the result of the Big Bang. You really believe that? Well, what is it the result of then? Um, and uh, he came down to your book versus our own eyes. And uh, he said, we need scientists and engineers. And that means we need science education. That means, uh, again, not specifically saying evolution is part of science, but just kind of assuming that that is part of science. Then, now they've gotten through their rebuttals, and you can see where we've gone so far. And we're going to go through the questions. I'll read the questions verbatim, but I'll kind of abbreviate the answers. How does creationism account for the celestial bodies, planets, stars, moons, moving further and further apart? And what function does that serve in the grand design? That was, of course, to Ken Ham, who said, the Bible says he stretches out the heavens. And he says, why? I don't know. And Bill Nye said, well, can you predict anything using your model? This is a theme that he pounded on again and again. The question to Bill Nye was, how did the atoms get there? And he said, this is a big mystery. The expansion is accelerating, and nobody knows why. And then Ken Ham came back with, there actually is a book out there that actually tells us where the matter came from. Um, referring, of course, to the Bible, and went on to say uh, matter can never produce information. Not, matter can never produce a language system. So he has some knowledge of intelligent design arguments. Um, the question three went to Ken Ham. The overwhelming majority of people in the scientific community have produced valid physical evidence, such as carbon dating and fossils, to support evolutionary theory. What evidence besides the literal word of God supports literal creation? And um, Ken Ham said, the majority is not the judge of truth, which is a good point. And he said, I made some predictions, referring to uh, predictions that he'd made in the past. Um, and, Ken, and Bill Nye, I'm sorry, said, if a scientist changes natural law, he is viewed as great. Say, so, you know, if you guys can do this, more power to you. Tell us why the universe is accelerating. Tell us why these mothers are getting sick, which was a reference to... Um, uh, Semmelweis's uh, comments. Now, of course, I thought it was interesting because Semmelweis died, rejected, and put in an insane asylum. Um, and it took decades before medicine finally caught up. And the same thing could be said of uh, Wegener. Uh, and so I don't think it's quite fair to say that uh, that scientists welcome change. But I don't think that Bill Nye has seen that picture of science yet. And it's one that could be po pointed out, I think. Um, the next question to Bill Nye was, how did consciousness come from matter? And Bill Nye says, I, I don't know. This is a great mystery. And he said, this is the joy of science, is the joy of discovery. Um, and uh, Ken Ham came back with, uh, there's a book out there. And then he said, uh, basically, what, if you die, what is the point of the joy of discovery? If you die, that's the end of it, if that's all there is to life. Implying, of course, that from his point of view, you get the joy of discovery forever. The next question was, what, if anything, would ever change your mind? 
which sounds like a simple question, but it's actually a very loaded one. Ken Ham said, I'm a Christian. God has definitely shown me very clearly through his word. The models are subject to change. Mr. Nye, you previously stated that even if you came to faith, you'd never accept billions of years. I mean, actually, that's kind of, uh, the, the billions of years are wrong is what it should read. And I'd have to go back and see whether that's Ken's uh, mistake or whether it's mine. But uh, th I think the point is, uh, regardless of whose mistake it is, um, uh, the point is that, uh, that yeah, we're, we're set in our ways, but so are you. And Nye basically denied that. Um, we would just need one piece of evidence. Wow. <coughs> we would need the fossil that swam from one layer to another. We would need evidence that the universe was not expanding, evidence that the stars appear to be farther away, but they're not, uh, evidence that rock layers could somehow form in just 4,000 years instead of the extraordinary amount, and that's a direct quote. Uh, well actually, this whole thing is a direct quote. We would need evidence that you could somehow reset atomic clocks and keep neutrons from becoming protons. Bring on any of these things and you would change me immediately. I'd like to have a talk with him about carbon-14. <laughs> And then he uh, went on to say, what can you prove? What can you really predict? And this is a theme that he kept coming back to. Next question is for Bill Nye. Outside of radiometric methods, what scientific evidence supports your view of the age of the Earth? And Bill Nye said, started out the age of the Earth. Well, the age of stars, let's see. And then he kind of recovered, realizing that the age of the Earth is what was being talked about. Um, and he said, radiometric evidence is pretty compelling. Kind of basically saying, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? And then he talked about uh, deposition rates, which is interesting, shall we say, and the skulls. And this is the one place where he ran out of time. And uh, the last few words were kind of lost because his microphone got cut. So they were really serious about those time limits. Um, and then um, Ken Ham said, no earth rock was uh, dated to get uh, that date, referring to 4.5 billion years for the age of the earth. And he said hundreds of, there are hundreds of physical processes and 90% argue for a young age. And the slide came back up. And he said, you can't prove young or old age. Basically, again, observational science is different from historical science. Question seven, can you reconcile the change in the rate continents are now drifting versus how quickly they must have traveled at creation 6,000 years ago? Aimed at Ken Ham, of course. And he said, we have scientists who have written papers about this on our website. I'm definitely not an expert on this, don't claim to be. Dr. Andrew Snelling and others are mentioned and he said, uh, he talked about catastrophic plate tectonics at the flood, moving much faster than usual. And he referenced Dr. Baumgartner, which I thought was good because he's kind of the closest thing to an authority that creationists have on that and has a really nifty computer program. Um, and he said, visit our website. And uh, Bill Nye said, it must have been easier for you meaning creationist, to explain this a century ago. Sea floor, he mentioned sea floor spreading, and then he mentioned the magnetic reversals that are recorded during that time. And he said, that's how we do it on the outside. Again, Ken Ham versus the world. Question eight, one word answer, please. Favorite color. That's a direct <laughs> quote. <laughs> and um, Bill Nye said, I will go along with most people and say green. And it's an irony that green plants reflect green light. And he kept on going for a while. And finally, the moderator kind of, no, we said one word. And so then Ken Ham said, can I have three words, since he had three, about 300? Uh, OK, observational science, blue. And he held up his necktie, which was mostly blue. <laughs> which is, I think, I think, a good way to draw a contrast there. Um, 
Question nine, how do you balance the theory of evolution with the second law of thermodynamics? And then the moderator, I think, added, what is the second law of thermodynamics? I suspect the moderator didn't know. Um, and uh, Bill Nye said, uh, the second law of thermodynamics is fundamental law. All systems lose energy to heat. Entropy is a disorder of molecules. The Earth is an open system. And that's how it escapes this uh, law of decay. And uh, Ken Ham said, energy or matter will never produce life. And he said, God imposed information. That's how things uh, came to be. The question was raised uh, with uh, Ken Ham, hypothetically, if evidence existed that caused you to have to admit that the Earth was older than 10,000 years and creation did not occur in six days, would you still believe in God and the historical Jesus of Nazareth and that Jesus was the Son of God? This is a question of how open are you to evidence? Or what, uh, can you make a Christianity without creation? And Ken Ham basically said there's no hypothetical. You can't prove using the scientific method the age of the earth. Uh, God revealed in his word what he did for us. So basically he said, I, I don't do those. And I said, this is where we disagree. You can prove the age of the earth with great robustness by observing the universe around us. And I get the feeling, Mr. Ham, that you want us to take your word for it. And then uh, a few more words, and he said, what is it that you can predict? Coming back to this predictions thing. The question that he then, uh, was then asked, is there room for God in science? And this is to Bill Nye. And of course, this is, well, aren't you guys just completely d don't have any use for God? And um, uh, put a, didn't put a space in where it belongs. Um, Bill Nye said, there are billions of people around the world who embrace science and especially technology, mobile phones, and then I'm abbreviating here, um, modern medicine, email, food. Um, science is a body of knowledge and a process. Mm -hmm. For me, that's not really connected with your belief that there's a spiritual being or higher power. If you reconcile these two, and then he went on to say, the head of the National Institutes of Health is a devout Christian. The exception is you, Mr. Ham. That's a problem for me. I encourage you to take the next minute to address the problem of the fossils, of the ice layers, ancient trees, the ark. I mean, really address it. All four of those in one minute? Whoa. And... Um, Ham's rebuttal came basically down to God is necessary for science, and I do, in fact, embrace technology. Um, in fact, if you look here, you'll notice that um, both of them have apples. Um, The next question, question 12, is do you believe the entire Bible is to be taken literally? For example, should people who touch pigskin be stoned? Can Mary marry multiple women? I'm not sure where pigskin touchers get stoned is in the Bible, but uh, maybe I didn't read it carefully enough. And Ken Ham said, is it important to define our t terms? Literally, what do you mean by literally? He says, I take the Bible naturally. Where it seems to be history, it's history. Where it's poetry, it's poetry. Where it's prophecy, it's prophecy. And then Ken Ham came, or pardon me, Bill Nye came back with, it sounds to me, just listening to the last two minutes, that there are certain parts of this document, the Bible, that you embrace literally and other parts you consider poetry. Why should we believe which ones you think are literal and which ones are poetry? And... Um, Question 13, have you ever considered that evolution was accomplished through way of a higher power? This, of course, is um, a, a, a dig at Bill Nye. Um, and the guy went on to say, this is the intelligent design question, I think. And then he said, if so, why or why not? Why could not the evolutionary process be accomplished in this way? There was apparently a, a word that was repeated. And in fact, we're going to see the original, and you're going to see why. Um, Tom Foreman had difficulty interpreting the question. The, he said, word for word, 
Have you ever believed that evolution partook through way of evolution? So whoever wrote the card has a little trouble with uh, um, their English, I guess. Um, and so remembering that that's kind of the general question, here is Bill Nye's response. The idea that a higher power is one you can't prove or di disprove, which is, uh, I think he wanted to say the idea of a higher power is one that you can, can't prove or disprove. Intelligent design has a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of nature. And then he gave the Paley's watch example. He didn't name Paley, he just said, you, you know, find a watch there. It's obviously made by someone who is thinking ahead, someone with an organizational chart with somebody at the top, and he'd order screws from the screw manufacturers and glass crystals from the crystal manufacturers. He couldn't make them himself. Um, but that's not how nature works. This is the fundamental insight in the explanation for living things that's provided by evolution. Evolution is a process that adds complexity through natural selection. And then going on to say, the perception that there's a designer that created all this is not necessarily true because we have an explanation that is far more compelling and provides predictions and things that are repeatable. <coughs> Coming back to the repeatable and predictions. And then Bill Ham's answer, what Mr. Nye needs to do for me is show me examples of something. I'm sure that he meant an example of something. Some new function that arose that was not previously possible from the genetic information that was previously there. The new genetic information. And I would claim and challenge you that there is no such example that you can give. That's, of course, a direct quote. And then uh, he said, Lenski and his bacteria is not an example. <coughs> um, question 14, name one institution, business, or organization other than a church, amusement park, or creation mu the Creation Museum that is using any aspect of creationism to produce the product. What use is creationism? And uh, Ham's answer was any scientist out there is using creation. They are because they are borrowing from the Christian worldview. They're using the laws of logic. Explain where the log laws of logic came from. Uh, you use logic, you're using our method. And then uh, Bill Nye's comment, the Kenham model has no predictive quality. Your worldview, what became of all those, this, uh, he switched gears on us. What, your worldview, what became of all those people who never heard of it? Asia, he mentioned Asia, the first nation in North America. Were they condemned? doomed. Uh, and then he switched back and said, you say there are no examples. I'm sure referring to the answer to the previous question, he said there are countless examples of how the process of science makes predictions. That wasn't the example, that wasn't the question that he asked, but Um, question 15, since evolution teaches that man is evolving and growing smarter over time, how can you explain the numerous examples of man's high intelligence in the past? That was to Ken Ham. Uh, I'm sorry, to Bill Nye. Uh, he said, we may not be the fittest, that is, the ones who fit in. So intelligence is not necessarily, uh, but then of course, how did we get there in the first place uh, was not answered. Um, Ken Ham mentioned my old professor who used to, was trying to persuade me of evolution and he said, see, these fish have evolved the ability not to see. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, question 16, and this is the last one. What is the one thing more than anything else upon which you base your belief? And again, how open are you? Are you really just a biased person telling us what you want to believe? And Ken Ham came back with, there is a book called the Bible, a special book. And he said, it gives the origin of everything. I actually went through some predictions and listed others, and there's a lot more that you can look at, and you can go and test it for yourself. Um, I wish he'd, he'd go through those point by point, because I think that that was one thing that just mentioning it once in the debate wasn't enough. 
And then Bill Nye, and he's finishing up now, says, as my old professor Carl Sagan used to say, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. He talked about this, the information and the process we call science. And he said, there's a second question that's really important. Are we alone? And that's how the debate ended. Now, my own view on this, I think strategically Ken Ham wanted to do several things. One of them he, was he wanted to argue that creationists could do good science. One of them was to argue for a difference between observational science and historical science. I think he wanted to, uh, behind all this, he wanted to expose people to creationism. I think he wanted to encourage belief in the Bible. And he wanted to argue to the audience that the true biblical position was creationism. There isn't a good halfway position. Now, I think that, in fact, he did a pretty good job at making his, those points. You could argue he could do better, but I'm sure that anybody who tried it, you could always argue they could do better. Um, and th that's one of the reasons why I don't want to call this a failure as a debate. I think it's harder for me to read Bill Nye's strategic goals, since I don't know him as, uh, and his philosophy as well personally. Uh, but I think that it's probably true that one of them was to raise his profile as someone who wasn't to, afraid to debate creationists. And of course, for both of these people, making yourself known t does translate to dollars, but I don't think either one of those people that that was the primary motivation. And in Bill Nye's case, raising a few extra dollars isn't a bad thing. I think that Bill Nye also thinks that creationists cannot have the joy of discovery. We already know all the answers, what's the point? I think that he has a real concern that creationists can't be scientists, or at least true scientists, and that our technology will suffer if we have too many of them, and therefore we should reduce their number. I think that he also thinks that creation science is driven by religion, is not falsifiable, cannot make predictions, and is therefore not science, and he wanted to expose this. I think he honestly believes that. That's what everybody around him is saying. I think that Ken Ham could have done better if he had fully realized Bill Nye's goals and countered them specifically. I think that Nye's first goal didn't need to be fought. Sure, we're having fun. Uh, in fact, the friendlier the debate, the better off. Um, and I think that the more discussions we have from here on out, the better off we are. I think the second goal of Bill Nye should have been countered explicitly multiple times with the idea that we really do understa enjoy understanding nature just as much as you do. And perhaps more so, as we believe, we're thinking God's thoughts after him when we do this. Now, this is not necessarily accurate for theistic evolutionists who believe in a god, for intelligent design advocates, or for old earth creationists. But I do think it's fair to make that argument for Bill Nye himself. And for any, new ath uh, any atheist or strong agnostic that, uh, that we wind up debating. I think that the third goal uh, um, Ken Ham was attempted to preempt it, but I think it should have been hammered again every time it was raised and in every summary, uh, Dr. Demadian does perfectly good science. How could he improve? Uh, I think I would have asked the question, how do you think he could have improved if he were an evolutionist? In other words, how did his creationism hold him back? And I don't think Bill Nye could have pointed to anything. And I think that the fourth goal of uh, Dr. Nye, uh, that is not Dr. Nye, I'm sorry, that's Mr. Nye, was unfortunately fudged. There were a few what I consider slow fastballs down the middle that, in my opinion, Ken Ham bunted. And, uh, except for, and a few curveballs that were whiffed 
except for the all-purpose historical science is not observational science. And I think he could have done better on that. Um, I think one of the, the questions there, are Christians are beyond the reach of evidence. You notice that early on he said, yes, you can find evidence for or against a worldview in observational science. Um, but I think if I had been asked, well, would anything change your mind? And my answer, and you know this is coming, so I think you have to be prepared for it, and I think my answer would have been, I could believe in unguided molecules to man evolution if, A, one could show that abiogenesis was either experimentally demonstrated or the steps could be listed and shown to be plausible and not prohibitively improbable. In other words, if you've got either good theory or, or, or experimental demonstration for the origin of life without intelligent input. B, one could show that for a substantial number of proteins, enough to where you could believe that the rest of them are the same way, including some of the more difficult ones, not just the ones that you have to change three amino acids. Um, there existed a step-by-step -step pathway to forming the protein with an advantage for each step for large animals, for large mammals, and, you know, humans, elephants, uh, that kind of thing, and no more than six neutral steps for bacteria and an appropriate number for intermediate animals. I don't think that you can do that. I don't see any evidence of that. I see pretty strong evidence against that. Why should I believe against the evidence? C, I think there needs to be a good long age explanation for such phenomena as sea salt, sodium, and potassium not being saturated. They should have been saturated a long time ago if the earth is that old. Periconformities, carbon-14 and fossil carbon, and erosion not destroying the Phanerozoic sediments that are on top of Mount Everest and the Matterhorn, to give two examples. And I think finally, I would need to see the prophecies in Scripture being debunked systematically to where it looks like they're all de debunkable. I think if you were to give me those evidences, all of them, I could change my mind. But, you see, rather than saying it's God's word and I'm hanging on to it, I'd say, hey, look, there's the evidence. What are you going to do with it? I think that one can believe firmly in the authority of Scripture without having to be dogmatic about one's belief. God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. What are you going to do with all that evidence? I would have come back, uh, are the English translations authoritative? My answer would have been only where they reflect the original Hebrew and Greek. That happens to be about 98% of the time, or better. Uh, it's not the English it's the original manuscripts that have the authority. Um, when he asked, can creationism make predictions, I would have pointed him to the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, which has been uh, researched on from a creationist basis and has been found not to be what it was popularly thought to be. Coconino sandstone footprints, which were originally thought to be in dry sand, turned out to be in underwater sand. Um, I would have pointed out carbon-14 dating. Of course, that's the one that I'm very familiar with. Um, I would have talked about the rate book findings. The uh, reason I wouldn't use paraconformities here is because, in fact, paraconformities are not specifically predictions. They're more like, we found this, and how do we explain it? What we want to be able to say is, you know what, you can go and find these things. I would say that one or two illustrations is better than throwing up a list of hundreds of unsorted data, data dating methods. I don't like the idea, oh, there's hundreds of different methods. I would say there's hundreds of different methods. Let's take an example. And if you want to pick on carbon-14 dating, if you want to pick on 
uh, one of the other ones, you can say this is how creationists do actually good research, some of which gets published in the secular literature. And I would have taken advantage of uh, Mr. Nye's professed openness. I hope that it's true. I think that it's true. If it's not true and you take advantage of it and he backs off, that says something to the audience as well. See, if he says he would change his mind on one piece of evidence, then give him one good dating method or one problem for long age and say, you wanted just one? Here's one. What do you do with it? I think the one thing that I would advise Ken Ham to do is rethink his theology very, very carefully. And I'll tell you why. The, you can ask the question, can God save someone who all he says God, is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, doesn't mention the name of the Messiah, doesn't even say the Messiah is coming to save me. If that is true, and Jesus seems to indicate he did, he used the word dikaiao to be made righteous for this guy. Then I think that one can reassure Bill Nye that Asians, First Nation Americans, whatever, who recognize that they are sinners and they need divine help, do have a chance for salvation and are not automatically condemned. And that takes the whole teeth out of Bill Nye's complaint that we, what about those people who never had a chance? I think that also one would say other Christians, those billions of people he referred to, which isn't necessarily true, but, but even if it is, who live up to the light they knew, but that doesn't include a literal creation, may be saved, in fact, in partial ignorance. And what you do then is you take out the God is an angry, vengeful God out of the equation. And I think that's really important. And it might even be important to Bill Nye if he suddenly realizes that God isn't that kind of a God, he might be more interested in hearing about the evidences of his existence. And finally, I would say the problem is not natural law changing. The problem is the refusal to accept the, re the possibility of miracle. And there are several considerations. I would just put this up front. Is there such a thing as a miracle? Could there be such a thing as a miracle? That's really the issue. It's not natural law. It's can God come in and do things according to, perhaps according to laws that he considers higher than natural law. See, miracles mean no rationality. That's a claim that's really a red herring. Miracles come for their own reasons. They're not just uh, nature does whatever it wants. They are God does whatever he wants, and he has purposes. Methodological naturalism is, in fact, a red herring. The decision to never deviate from methodological naturalism is, in fact, indistinguishable from philosophical naturalism, and I would argue they're the same thing. Um, if you claim that being objective means that everyone will agree or anyone who is exposed to the evidence will agree is also a red herring. You see, if objectors to miracles see any event, they will refuse to see the supernatural no matter how much evidence there is. And therefore, not everybody will agree, so it can't be science. Disbelievers in miracles may thus hold science hostage to their belief. Interestingly, if we try that, they just kick us out of science. So you see what's being happening is people are saying, oh, we're just going to be scientific. And what they mean by scientific is we're going to be friendly to atheists. Um, but that's my opinion. And now it's your turn. Uh, we have a question way in the back here. Aren't there predictions? Just a minute. The mic is coming to you so we can actually record this. 
Aren't there predictions that creation science has made and makes that have been hotly debated in science, like the Big Bang, like the expanding universe, like the limits and failure of the Miller-Urey experiments on abiogenesis, that you could say when steady state was the, the norm, the orthodoxy, the creationists were back then saying, no, God is the only thing that's eternal, matter is not, matter had a start, there was a beginning. In other words, there are uh, predictions in even what we say today, the, the finding of the planets and the habitable zones, right? To a certain extent, you would think that the creationist model, George McCready Price or whatever, was his, his model of the universe or his view would have predicted, yes, if you had the ability, you could find planets in the habitable zone, there was a start to matter, the universe is expanding, there is a limit to abiogenesis. You, you would think there was a number of predictions that creation science could make. Well, in regard to the Big Bang, and this is kind of an important one to remember, um, I don't think Ken Ham it would be comfortable with arguing that way. It, uh, I am somewhat comfortable arguing that way because I have an old universe and a young Earth. Um, so for me, you say, look, this was rejected, and it was rejected for explicitly <laughs> religious reasons in some cases or if you want to call it that, a religious reasons. Um, and yet it seems to be better than any of the models that we have. And even if you don't buy the Big Bang itself, if you want to go with plasma physics or something like that, it does still seem that the universe is expanding. And that means that if you project it backwards in time, it is contracting. And it eventually, Stephen Hawking went on to prove that if you leave the matter, if you don't have creation of matter somewhere in there, uh, that it contracts to a point, and at that point the laws of physics don't apply. Um, and we have no way of saying whether there was something before or whether there should have been something before. And in fact, if you believe that the second law of thermodynamics is as fundamental as Bill Nye does, and I do, at least certainly for our universe today, um, that they if there was a previous universe, it must have been even um, more uh, ordered than ours is. Uh, and uh, it does raise the question that you, know, you can't just keep on getting more and more order as you go back. Eventually, you run out of time. And I think that it's fair to argue that way. But again, I think that's an argument that Ken Ham would not touch. And so I don't advocate him going outside of his comfort zone unless and until he decides that, you know, his comfort zone can include an old universe. Um, and so I don't, I think it's a valid argument for us to use. I don't think it would be a valid argument for Ken Ham to use. Yeah. To me, uh, one of the most disappointing features of this uh, discussion was uh, uh, Ken Ham uh, kind of uh, hesitating to uh, be rational, uh, at least in the latter part there. Uh, at the beginning, he did he he did a pretty he good was at the beginning at he was at the beginning, but in the latter part, uh, uh, this uh, seems to be a little bit disturbing because it, it says that uh, well, uh, truth is not rational. And I would expect that truth would be more rational than error. I have a hard time getting around that particular principle. Uh, to, to me, uh, and I do respect uh, Ken Ham and his faith, and I do respect others, and I know many Christians start with the Bible. That's the authority. They don't ask the question, you know, uh, how do you know the Bible is true? At least when they make that statement, they don't, they're not asking that. I think indirectly they all ask that question, more or less, you know. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that the, the approach that I gave is one that they could honestly sign on to. Sure. I, it's uh, just that I think mm. that they are not as aware of this is where you're going to get hammered, and if you don't have an answer, uh, you're going to look like 
one of those mm -hmm. yahoos that, you know, their minds are already made up. They don't have anything to do with uh, science or discovery or, you know, they don't make predictions. Uh, and and this, is, this is Bill Nye's perception mm -hmm. of them, and uh, they just reinforced it when they said, uh, well, it's the Bible. I would add to this that uh, the Bible itself encourages us to be rational, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Uh, it encourages us to, us to look at nature uh, and see that, uh, you know, God's eternal power and glory is, is demonstrated by the things that are created and so on. Uh, so uh, to me, the rational approach seems a little sounder. I want to know why I believe the Bible. Geographically, it seems to be correct, and uh, it's got a lot of evidence to support it. Uh, prophecy, you mentioned, and so on. Uh, but to, to me, the, the crucial issue is more along the line, uh, abiogenesis, for instance. Uh, there is very good, hard, experimental science that says, hey, uh, there has to be a designer in what I see here. Uh, and once you admit there's a God, then your horizon changes completely. Then the exclusion of miracle becomes irrational. Yes, and I, I think we need to be careful about miracles. I like to hold the bar for miracles fairly high. Uh, most of the time they don't occur and rational mm -hmm. science works and so on, but also, the rational science tells me there has to be miracle, for instance, like the origin of life uh, type of thing. And I think a broader approach like that is more likely to find truth than to just say, hey, no, yeah. I'm going to be just a, uh, a naturalistic scientist. Uh, you can call it a methodological scientist, which is uh, basically I'm going to be an atheist in my physical approach here. I'm not going to allow God in the picture. Uh, this if, is no if God can be in the picture, then not allowing God in the picture is irrational. This is nowhere to find truth if, in case God exists. Uh, so science's closed system is, is really a, not the way to go. A broader approach is broader, and uh, I wish Ken had uh, uh, been more rational uh, and his basic approach there. Now, I will say this much. What he did, I think, encourages the faithful. You can trust the Bible. What it did not do is to encourage the fence-sitters to come in. Right, if you, but if you want to talk to scientists, you need to use their language. You know, I, we probably don't know the answer to this, but I'd be curious as to what sort of debate prep process um, Ken Ham went through as to whether he got you know, input on, on questions such as what sort of questions would you expect to have and what sort of responses might be the most effective. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I, d I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that one of these days I'll meet him personally and be able to, to ask him those questions. Well, we might, uh, you know, we may have missed an opportunity because we knew that this debate was, going, was coming up. And, and I'm, I'm guessing there's probably very little reaching out to him saying, hey, could we send you any, you know, send you a document suggesting what we think might come up and what might be good, some good responses that's, to that. That's probably true. Um, um, also, I think it could be. We're, we're all very busy, and so, yeah. and, but, you know, um, we're kind of like the guy in the, uh, talking to King Ahab, who was, while he was busy here and there, the, the, the man I was supposed to be guarding left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, also, I think it would have been nice if if Ken Ham had had like a chat window open and there and there you know there was you know logged on to to creation scientists who could you know in real time actually suggest some responses uh, because you know certain things that you you may not be able to predict specifically what might be brought up and so to have multiple you know intelligent people yeah. listening to the debate, debate live and then quickly typing in a response could uh, maybe could help. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for doing this is not just to dissect, you know, what he did wrong and what he did right, but it's also to say, you know, there will be more debates sooner or later. 
And I think all of us need to be aware of, of, of what kinds of things drive the other side, what kinds of things are important to them. Their openness, even though we don't see it as openness, is in fact important to them. And I think we should take advantage of it. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't mean of that in a, an exploitive way, but I mean that in a, uh, in a, you know, if we're trying to reach them, the, reaching them through their openness, okay, you know, you need one piece of evidence. Well, what about this one? And rather than throwing hundreds of them at him at, at, at one time when he's never read any of them and he thinks that they're all balderdashing, anyway, throw one at him that he has to deal with. And in fact, I think this can be done on an interpersonal level too. You have a friend who's an atheist. Well, why do you believe in Christianity? I mean, that's, you know, that's an old book. It uh, doesn't really have anything to say. And all the scientists have done this. And, you know, science is really open. Hey, if you had something like that, we'd prove it. We'd love it. Well, what about, uh, what do you do with paraconformities? What do you do with paleocurrents? But rather than just list five or six really good ones, List one and then go through that one in depth. And then they say, whoa. And then when you bring the second one in, they're starting to think, you know, maybe this guy's got something. So I, I think that it's important for us to think about it, not just in terms of, you know, who won the debate and keeping score and, you know, it was, uh, Nye three and ham four, or nigh four and ham three, or something like that. You know, it's more like what are the issues that are being discussed, and where are they misunderstanding us that we could clarify and maybe make uh, help them to understand where we're coming from. You know, there there's also I, I I've looked on YouTube and there's a lot of analysis where people put up videos of you know, they're a talking head just discussing about what they thought about it. And that's sort of a good way to, um, if, you know, if we had uh, produced a, a video response or almost have it ready to go. Well, you, you realize that we do have a video response right now. Uh, is it on YouTube? This will be on YouTube okay. this afternoon. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me just uh, mention something else that I sort of noticed. And in, in, I found it intriguing that uh, Bill Nye Oh, okay. um, brought up the, the issue of, you know, are we, ahead, we'll you know, if we haven't accepted the name of Jesus, are, are we condemned? Are we doomed? You know? And that is really fundamentally, I think, a religious question. And it's interesting that he is, you know, he's bringing up religious questions, not just scientific questions. Of course. Um, there is not the sharp dividing line that they want to pretend. It, it seems, though, he cares about the religious questions, and it just makes one wonder whether how much of his commitment to to atheism is based on a rejection of his view of God, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Uh, and you know, I'm, I recall, you know, watching. Um, I'm sorry, who's the who's sort of the number one atheist in England? Dawkins. Yeah, Dawkins. Yeah. I mean, you know, he 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 sort of brings up this really religious issues that if if God exists, I'd have to believe that he's like the Old Testament God. So he has like real, almost emotional sort of views. Um, and I, you know, I just wonder how much is, is this driving? God so doesn't exist and boy am I glad. Right, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead and we have a comment here. Yeah, the, um, the overall uh, you know, I, I applaud all the people. I mean, this is a long time coming, this, this debate. We've been wanting this debate to happen, I'm, I know. And it at least has started, you know. And hopefully it's not ended <laughs> with this. I don't think so. It's, it's broken the ice. And I applaud all the people that made this occur. Uh, I don't know who this were besides these two guys, but I'm sure there were others. Um, but I, I think the, uh, the, the structure of the debate overall was very poor. I mean, you just, 
I, I would have structured this completely different myself um, to deal, like you said, with the issues and uh, had kind of the, I mean, as was mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, I mean, like, uh, they both basically know what they're going to say. I mean, they know the issues that they're, they're going to be, you know, uh, the weapons that they're going to be using against each other. Um, so why not pick a few of those areas for this, whatever it was, an hour, whatever it was, uh, to deal with? One will say, I'm going to present this, and this is, you know, basically my evidence. They could add things to that. But then the other person will know, okay, now I have to defend, you know, that evidence with my evidence. So at least the evidence was able to get out um, in a reasonable way. I think, uh, hopefully, like I said, this isn't the end. I don't know. I haven't heard anything that uh, what's going to happen, but maybe they're waiting for the the chit chat to continue and maybe the dust to settle. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think uh, Bill Bill Nye kind of tended to to uh, be more uh, seemed like leading the b debate and in uh, general. Ham was kind of more defensive, and then, like we said, uh, he, well, he, I, I admit, though, that he was, I, I don't know, he's, he wasn't, you have to be prepared with the evidence, you know, not just opinion. You yeah. know, like, have a stack of books there. Say, okay, this person, this scientific research was done, and back me, back this up. Yeah, yeah like, uh, Nye, uh, he, he had a, a picture of all kinds of skulls there. Well, you could pick, you know, you can't deal with all of them, but pick one or two. But you could and have then, come and, and said, and here's a book that deals with all those skulls. Yeah. We don't have time to do that here, but, but we do have answers. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they actually did some of that. Uh, but they could have done more, I agree. Uh, I, I would have just, uh, you know, put up, oh, here's the web link that deals with that specific question. Here's the web link that deals with that specific <coughs> question. Just to let people know that it's, that it, you're not catching us flat-footed. We actually, we know about these issues and we, we've dealt with them. <coughs> what you just said actually has happened. If you go to the Creation Ministries International, their website, which is simply creation.com. On February 6th, they posted a very lengthy posting, first summarizing the debate, and then going through all the, the specific issues. And they have a link for everything that Bill Nye brought up in terms of criticism. They have a link to creationist literature on the web. And so I was, I have my computer here, so I was uh, interested how they uh, solved the. Uh, marsupial problems, uh, kangaroos, and we have one Aussie here, Dr. Brandstater, and maybe some others that I don't know about. But it, it's an interesting problem, and this has been batted around for years by creationists. But here's the link. The link uh, is to CMI's article called Biogeography. It's very uh, scholarly and very well done. But they have to explain how the marsupials got to Australia and speciated. So there's four major ways that you can explain it. Oh, they have to explain it scientifically. By the way, others, creationists sometimes have said, well, the angels picked up the animals and took them from the ark, mm -hmm. which you've jumped right out of science, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> the angels don't go that far. <laughs> anyway, the first one, just real quick summary, is transoceanic transport on vegetation mats. Now, when you look at Krakatoa, how did all those animals get there, and even snakes? Uh, some of them were floating on vegetation mats. You mean after the blow up when yeah, it killed everything? The, yeah, after then, then it was the repopulated. Blown up. How did they get to a desolate piece of volcanic rock and repopulate. A uh, second one is transport by man. So we got to look at back, when did the first uh, aborigines get there? And did they bring some of these animals from the ark? We got to look at that. 
And then the other thing is migration and partial extinction, whatever that means. And then the interesting one is speciation. I think migration and partial yeah. extinction uh, they're talking about is basically everything migrated everywhere. But the kangaroos all oh, died out in Asia right. and, the, and, and survived in Australia, whereas the, the uh, let's say the tigers migrated everywhere but died out except yeah, in Yeah, and the possums, possums made it to South America, but the Australian opossums got edged out and they got killed off or something. Speciation is an interesting one. In this article it says that you can actually have marsupials speciate after the flood. I'd never heard that before. And they're basing it on the Tasmanian devil having a skull that's almost identical to a, an extinct European wolf skeleton. So they compare the two skeletons and say that they had common genetics that were in play after the flood and, and you could have some of the genes being expressed producing our marsupials after the flood. So, One so possibility. that instead of marsupials being the, the root thing, that you could actually make marsupials out of Out of a placental. Placental. And that's By in maybe this article. Maybe horizontal genetic transfer. Yeah, whatever uh, means turning genes on and off. And so for what it's worth, this is what I came up with as a response to Bill Nye. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll just make a comment about uh, Bill Nye's uh, repeated uh, appeal to the uh, fossil sequence as uh, being uh, a real problem. And, and it is a problem, I think it's a problem uh, for everybody, but I, I felt he was using it without understanding uh, the, f the way the fossil sequence is determined, it's determined on the basis of whatever uh, fossil you define. When you find a fossil lower down, uh, you just extend the range of that fossil in the fossil record. And uh, so you, you, you would always, you're always going to find a sequence there, no matter what uh, uh, the findings are per se. Uh, well, well, the thing I found interesting is that I think I can c come up with several examples off the top of my head of fossils that didn't uh, manage to swim upward. Um, uh, coelacanth or calacanth, however you pronounce that, being one of them, and, um, and horseshoe crabs being another. they both extinct. Ginkgo is the same way. They're extinct. They're, you can't find them in the fossil record. And then all of a sudden, they pop up in uh, the deep sea off India or China or something. And, and what do you know? Uh, those ones swam upward. Uh, and according to uh, ecological zonation, uh, you would not expect to find mammals uh, in the lower layers. The one <laughs> exception might be whales that died a few years before the flood. And well. And it may be the year of the flood. Uh, and it would be really interesting to s you, you remember that the whales, the whales were, were not found way back when until somebody started looking for them hard. Yeah. Maybe we should start looking in the Paleozoic somewhere. And of course, you'd, you'd whale expect bodies. whales to float away in the flood. Uh, I mean, to not. <laughs> well, be, uh, yeah, they, they float better than some thing. fish. So that's probably there's true. That, there's that aspect to it, too. But, but I think but, that, the, uh, the, that, that they are the single thing that you might. I mean, Cambrian rabbit, that's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Uh, Rabbits have trouble breathing in the Cambrian. Well, yeah, we don't find cows in the ocean right now. You wouldn't expect to find. Uh, uh, mammals in the lowest uh, layers. I mean, e ecological zonation does provide some uh, rationality for the sequence we do find there. Yeah. Uh, but it would be very interesting to see if we could find some modern species down there. Sure, sure. Especially if we found mammalian species. It would make, uh, it would make things very interesting for evolutionists. Um, many years ago, they were having problems with rats in Guam. Anyone heard about that? that so the politician says, let's have snakes. They brought in snakes from wherever. Now they have huge fence around the airport because they don't allow those snakes. The snakes have taken over Guam. So uh, they don't allow, uh, they have a big fence, you know, so that the snakes cannot get in and wrap around the wheels of the planes and come to the continental U.S. So this is a big problem. Same way with a wild vine somewhere in the south. If you drive uh, 75 
you see these vines have really taken over the huge forest could you or something like that yeah yeah right right you know the problem was in the old days it was the politicians that allowed the kangaroos to go to australia you know and places, <laughs> things like that i think that's the answer on a serious note on a serious rabbits note, i think got loose and, and yeah. took over the place right <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> on, a, on a serious note, many years ago I attended one of Ken Ham's uh, seminars. I was amazed to see at least three Adventist books that he was selling. Coffin, I think uh, Coffin and, uh, and Clark, I think Clark is one of those. Yes, um, what if we, this class, sponsored him to come here, you know, for a weekend, uh, or even night, uh, see what we are doing? Uh, and then might might be work with this gentleman. By the way, well, I, I, is an Australian. By the way, also I do know that I went there uh, to visit the uh, museum, and I didn't think to ask them to ahead of time. Uh, but after I saw them, they said that I was welcome to come down there as long as they gave me, uh, as long as I gave them enough notice, and I could talk in their auditorium, which I think is the same one that they had the debate in. So. Uh, they're they're friendly, yes. very friendly. Uh, one of these days, when I go visit my son in Kentucky, I'll just zip northern uh, northerly a little bit, and we'll uh, we'll have some fun. Yeah. There's so much to be said about this debate that I don't know where to begin, and I, once I begin, I wouldn't know when to end. Uh, <laughs> I first of all. I admired Bill Nye's general tone. He was respectful of Ken Ham the man. He didn't respect his opinions, but he, he gave certain uh, deference to Ken Ham's person as a, as a human being who had sincere convictions. He didn't say you're an idiot? No, there was no ad hominem uh, uh, remarks from Bill Nye, and in fact, he almost suggested there was a, a, a degree of openness in his own mind. He was willing to listen. I did feel that, that Ken Ham failed rather, I say this respectfully, miserably, in, in approaching the debate in the terms in which its goal was expressed. Uh, the, the whole theme of the debate was is creation a viable model in our present day culture which is science based? That was the, the purpose. In other words, this debate must be carried out and, and carried on uh, with reference to the scientific data. Yeah. No, Ken he Ham did a piece of it. neglected that. He did a piece of that. He said creationists can be good scientists. Look at this creationist who's a good scientist. That creationist who's a good scientist. I'm not saying And I he, think that that was it. a partial answer. But I agree with you. I don't think it was a complete one. He didn't have th some of the items which you listed here, uh, Paul, regarding the, the data, the hard one, two, three, four, uh, and the whole range of scientific arguments that have come out of the Discovery Institute for intelligent design, no reference to sacred writings at all, pure science and probability science. It's, it's unanswerable, and there has not been a persuasive answer to Michael Behe, uh, irreducible complexity, or the writings of Bill Dembski. Those things have been ignored by the, the world of atheist science, and Ken Ham simply neglected to use what to me at least has been the the most powerful evidence in denial of Bill Nye's naturalist uh, approach to science and reality that's all well I agree with you except here's what happened is that he mentioned little things in passing that if you understand what the debate is about you would catch them but people who are not on the top level of the debate would fly right by them, and it flew right by Bill Nye, and it flew right by most of the people who were listening who were on the fence because they're not as familiar with the issues. 
And I think that you have to pull those things out and hammer on them just the same way Bill Nye hammered on what predictions do you make? What predictions do you make? What predictions do you make? Can, can this theory function as a scientific theory that can make predictions and then hit them? And that's the kind of thing that he should have been hammering back. Look at the evidence here. This is a prediction we made. This is how it came out. And maybe hammering another one so that you see it's a, not just a one-trick pony. And, and doing it again. And just hammering it. And every time you make a presentation at your five-minute uh, 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 summary at the beginning, at your half-hour thing, you pound it for three or four minutes so that you can't get away from it. And then every time he makes a comment that says, what predictions do you make? Well, we predicted this, and we predicted this. And people will remember, yes, you did actually make that point, and you made it pretty strongly. Um, you can't just touch things and assume that people will, well, you have to get, you have to just keep hammering at them. I was disappointed just in the one just follow on comment. The final question, or the very, a very late question, what would it take to have you change your mind? I was deeply dissatisfied with, with Ken Ham's response there. How did you like mine? Oh, I, I thought yours were m far superior to Ham's. Far superior. So At least you were giving scientific data. And Ken Ham was effectively saying, uh, I base my worldview upon the Bible, which is beautiful, except that it was totally outside the, the whole theme of the debate. That doesn't make sense in today's modern scientific world. And you can't start with the Bible in that situation, or at least if you do, you're going to have to justify why you start with the Bible. And there's no time for that. Um, I was wondering about the whole speciation moving to different continents. Um, as I understand it, uh, Genesis 10 says, uh, 1025 it talks about Eber was, to, was born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided and his brother's name was Joktan. My understanding was in the days of Peleg, that's when a lot of people think the continents were divided. This is a little bit after the flood. Could that explain some animals migrating after the flood and then they get cut off from the rest of civilization after the continent split? Um, it does make that problem easier to solve. It raises some other problems as the spreading of the continents apparently involved, among other things, India hitting the uh, continent of Asia and raising Mount Everest. And the, what, f f three or four lar highest peaks in the world, or, or th I think five highest peaks, something like that. It's quite a few of them anyway that, that are higher than any place else in the world, including the Andes Mountains, which is, I think, the second highest. Um, and, and so you have to say, well, that must have happened during historical times. And unless you have some kind of legends that say that these mountains were raised up while we watched, you're going to have some difficulties with that. Um, so it does help in one area. It doesn't help in another area. And I, I guess we'll have to see how it balances out. If you're asking my personal opinion, I think the weight of evidence is against it, but I wouldn't say that it's so far against it that nobody should investigate. Oh, I would just throw in, since we're talking so much about uh, predictions, uh, one of the major predictions of creation is that you'd find gaps in the fossil record, and that is uh, amply represented, although uh, occasionally, uh, People suggest, well, these have been covered up or they've been found and so on. Uh, that is not correct at all in, in terms of the, what we've studied here before in terms of the Cambrian explosion and so on. Uh, between the major groups, the gaps, they're there, they're solid, and that's what I'd predict from creation. I would predict just the opposite from evolution. Um, do we have anybody who predicted ahead of time that those gaps would be there? That's the beauty about carbon-14 dating is actually I have two articles, one of which says, this is what we should find, and the other one says, here's what we found. 
And then a third one that says, we went into the laboratory and checked it out, and yes, you know, all those other people are right. It's much easier to make predictions after the fact. <laughs> it, it is, it is. Um, <coughs> come in over here, uh, we have, oh, yeah, I'll get, go ahead. Okay, um, if, uh, if that, uh, I'm sorry, that museum, the Creation Museum, is it in Kentucky? Uh, Paul, if they invited you to use the conference center for a lecture, uh, might, and if that was the, the, the lecture hall that uh, was used for this debate, might they uh, be willing to let you use that for a debate to where you were to find somebody, uh, maybe on the East Coast? That's trusting somebody from the outside with a lot. <laughs> I don't know whether they would or not. That, that yeah, uh, they yeah. probably want to see me and hear me talk plain before they did that. Yeah, that's um, true. I, I mean, who knows? God works in mysterious ways, and it might turn out that way. But, uh, but I, I, I'm doubtful that that will happen as the first shot. Yeah, you're probably right. What about some sort of University of Kentucky? In other words, what what I'm talking about here is maybe trying to develop a, a relationship or, or some acquaintance on their, their part with you so that in the future they might be willing to, mm -hmm. you know, collaborate with you in, in future yeah. opportunities. Now I'll tell you what my philosophy on those kinds of debates is. Uh, number one is that I think that if either side wins, because they surprise the other with novel information, that it's interesting for the debate, but it doesn't advance the cause of truth because now you're judging by who's got the best oppo research instead of who's got the best model. And I would try to start out by saying, look, let's cooperate in this much. I'm going to send you my material. You send me your material. And when we get done, we'll try to make something that that makes, you know, that 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 synthesizes how the other person looks at things, so that we're talking to each other rather than past each other. I, I think that's one thing that happened at this debate more than I liked. It there was some meeting, but there wasn't, and and Bill Nye even said he had learned something from Ken Ham. But I think that it would be, I think it would be helpful for us to come at it in an open way. And I think if they clammed up on their side, it actually would say something. Look, I sent you this stuff so you know what's coming. And of course, that's not the way most people debate. But then I don't think we should be debating in the classic sense. This should not be aimed for points. This should be aimed for finding truth. And so I would even rather call it a discussion rather than a debate. And maybe after presentation here, presentation there, sit down and both people just talk to each other. At least that's my personal theory. Um. In the 1970s, there were molecular biologists here at Loma Linda predicting that junk DNA would turn out to be not junk DNA. Unfortunately, it wasn't published at that time, but it was published quite a few years before the ENCODE project showed that, that in fact, junk DNA is not junk DNA. So there's one prediction for you. Um, I, I think that that's, uh, it, th what we need to do is we need to document when it was, in fact, published and if you know personally when these people were saying this, that you say, you know, they were saying this 10 years before it actually got in print. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that we could say. I also, you're working on a book? A revision of Earth, uh, a revision of Earth uh, Faith, Reason, and Earth History. And, and some of it is going to be on predictions that's that creation of science makes that have come out, Yeah, um, we need that book. As soon as you get it done, come here and we'll display it to the world. We really do need that book. Because as you can see, this is one of the big selling points for people who respect science, especially for its empirical quality. The thing about Bill Nye is, you know, he says, and you can do this in your own kitchen. 
you know. I put vinegar and baking soda and it fizzes. Look, try it at home. Um, and this is what he's looking for in science. You went out and you looked at the Coconina sandstone and you did experiments with lizards and salamanders climbing up dry mountains, slightly wet mountains of sand, right? Underwater, whatever, and you can say, look, th this is the most likely. That's the kind of thing that, that, that uh, Bill Nye would eat up. And that's the kind of thing that we need. And if we have a book and you can say, look, this book has experiments on lizards, look it up here. I'll give you the, ex the example. And I think that will just really impress them. And in fact, if they hear about it ahead of time, uh, you know, we've had people come here from the other side and given them a chance to present. And telling them our points ahead of time, and when they come, they make a much more respectful presentation because they realize that this isn't just, uh, you know, some idiot's opinion, that they're actually good evidence for it. And I think that the more we have a respectful debate, the more people are likely to see us as being reasonable and respectful people. Well, I will let you know what's coming next week in the newsletter, which most of you get. If you don't get the newsletter, uh, give me your email and I'll put you on the, the list. And your email address will be private to you and us and nobody else. And not even the other people on the list get it.